Um, all right, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, I know every time, if you've been to my other talks, every time I apologize for my corona hair. It's going to get more out of control each time. Uh, still haven't still haven't dealt with it, so uh, bear with me as uh, it takes up most of the screen. Um, <clears throat> I um, wanted to uh, talk today about uh, something that I think uh, most of us, even if we have learned uh, a little bit of Tanakh and the Bible, probably uh, didn't get to. Uh, I can say as somebody who grew up, um, you know, learning uh, in a Jewish day school system for I don't know, uh, <clears throat> 14 years. Uh, I never really learned about this part of the Tanakh. Um, and I think that it's actually um, really um, interesting because it answers a question that, um, that, I, that I think that uh, really, sh if you're looking um, at Jewish history, you really, you really have to ask. So, I mean, I should say, uh, we hear all the time about the Jewish people's improbable perseverance, right? It's amazing that we still exist. I don't know how it happens. Um, I, see, uh, I see some of my uh, alumni here and, and you can ask them. Uh, I sometimes have them keep a running tally of the amount of times I say the phrase, and this is when the Jewish people should have died out. Um, you know, if they were college kids, it probably would have been a drinking game. Um, but, uh, the truth is, it's completely true. It makes no sense that the Jewish people are still here. And uh, it's one of the most improbable stories in world history. Um, and one of the reasons given usually for this whole incredible, um, incredible uh, survival uh, is, you know, people like to say one word that they think it's simple, I think it explains the whole thing, and they say hope. Oh, sorry, actually, I just remembered also to share my slideshow. Okay. Hope. They like to talk about hope as the, uh, you know, the key thing that say, that helps the Jewish people um, survive. Now, that's nice, but the question is, is it true? What does that mean, hope? You know, hope is very um, abstract. It's a very abstract phrase. So the question I, I wanted to really ask was, can hope really be that powerful? Could it really be what's responsible for this amazing um, tale of survival by the Jewish people. Um, and I actually want to argue that yes, it, it hope in fact can be um, that powerful. And I think also obviously this message of hope is some, one that is relevant to all times and especially our time now and you know, really any time in history. Um, but hope can be that powerful. And I think there's no better evidence of the power of hope uh, than the passage in the Tanakh that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I, I really do think that we'll, we'll be able to see it that way. Um, I should also say that, as I was saying, I never really learned this passage. I was beginning to say that. And um, I kind of, when I did first learn about it, I kind of became a little bit fascinated by it. And I started seeing it in all these places that I never knew it was there. And, and hopefully um, I'll share that with you as well. But before I actually get to the passage, uh, I need to set the stage uh, historically a bit, right? Uh, so let's let's set the stage. Um, when King Solomon built the temple at, in around 1000 BCE, uh, the Jews were in the land of Israel, and we had reached pretty much our pinnacle of spirituality as well as sovereignty, right? Uh, the Jews were um, pretty um, unified under David and Shlomo, uh, these two leaders uh, of the three kings, uh, you know, Saul, David, and Shlomo, Solomon. And um, by the time Solomon builds this temple to God, uh, things are pretty good. Unfortunately, though, uh, it's going to be all downhill from there because um, Solomon, uh, for different uh, interpreters give different reasons, but uh, after the death of Solomon, um, we descend into sectarian disagreement and all out civil war in which we see the Northern Kingdom uh, and the Southern Kingdom, right, the North of, uh, of, of of the land of Israel and the south of the, of the land of Israel physically split into two separate um, nations. Um, the north becomes the kingdom of Israel, right? Uh, conquered, and that becomes conquered in 722 BCE by the Assyrians. Uh, the south nearly does as well. Um, and the south becomes uh, the kingdom of Judah. Now, the kingdom of Judah is going to survive for about another 150 years uh, or less, more or less. Um, but uh, unfortunately, in 586 BCE, uh, we know that the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar II 
destroys the Beit HaMikdash and exiles many of the Jews of that to Babylonia uh, in something that we now refer to as Galut Babel, or the Babylonian exile. Okay? The Jews were spiritually decimated by this. And, and we know it because it's actually enshrined in our liturgy. Um, right? If you take a look, um, I actually uh, shared on the right side here uh, a psalm, Psalm 137. Uh, and it's uh, a pretty famous one. I think it even became a pop song. It's called uh, By the Rivers of Babylon, right? And uh, it tells the story of the Jews when they arrive in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept and thought of Zion. And there we hung our poplars, right? Our, and we hung up our lyres, right? On the trees, we had to hang up our, our, our um, instruments. For our captors asked us to there to, for a song, our tormentors to amuse us, sing us one of your songs of Zion, right? So the Babylonian captors are mocking us. Oh, why don't you sing us one of your songs about Jerusalem now that Jerusalem has been destroyed? Um, and this song, honestly, I don't know people like, I don't know how well of people have looked at it, but it's, it's actually heartbreaking. Um, and uh, the second half of it actually is interesting too, because the second half of it gives us another famous uh, phrase, which is, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, uh, right? The famous Machado song. Uh, probably that's how most people know it these days. Um, now, I don't know if that's really hope. I would say that's not hope as much as it is, as it is longing, um, but it's, let's say it's pre-hope. Um, but again, it, it just goes to show you just how um, devastating uh, the destruction of the temple and the exile to Babylon uh, really was for the Jewish people. Um, and I think that that is our, is our first clue, and it is the important uh, backstory um, to the passage that we're going to talk about now um, today. So it is with these uh, people, broken and in despair, um, when uh, the prophet Ezekiel comes to them, uh, and gives them this message of hope. Now, uh, I should say Ezekiel is one of the later prophets. The early prophets were really around to keep the kings in check and make sure they were behaving according to God's will. The later prophets had no problem going directly to the people and chastising and rebuking them for their sins. Uh, now, there is another side to that, of course, which is that in addition, and you'll see this in almost every single book, right? Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah, um, Hosea, um, all the all, all the later prophets, you'll see that like the first half of, the, of their book is like, the Jews are bad for X, Y, Z. You guys are doing horrible things, X, Y, Z. And the second half of the book is usually a message of hope and redemption. Um, and uh, this is true with Ezekiel too, and specifically uh, here in chapter 37, uh, what we call the prophecy of the vision of the dry bones. Uh, now, I wouldn't generally read a giant passage to you, but I am going to read some uh, or, or most of it, because I think it's important for the rest of what we're talking about today to, to hear um, what we're talking about. So just really quickly, um, the hand of the Lord came upon me, right? This is a vision that Ezekiel has, right? He falls asleep, maybe, or we'll get to this in a second, whether or not he was awake or dreaming or it was real. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the hand of the Lord came upon me. He took me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in a valley. Uh, behold, it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many of them spread over the valley, and they were very dry, he said, O mortal, can these bones live again? And I said, O Lord God, only you know. Prophecy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Right? I prophesied as, as I had been commanded, and while I was prophesying, suddenly there was a sound of rattling, and the bones came together, bone matching bone. Um, then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, say to the breath, thus said the Lord, come, O breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live again. Uh, he does so, and... Um, God says to, to, um, to Ezekiel, O mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are doomed. Prophecy therefore and say to them, I am going to open your graves and lift you out of your graves, my, my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. You shall know, O my people, that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and lifted you out of your graves. All right. Uh, I will put breath into you and you shall live again and I will set you upon your own soil. Then you shall know that the Lord has spoken and has acted, declares the Lord. Okay, so that um, is, is the prophecy, um, uh, you know, just kind of jumping around a few lines. But basically, Ezekiel sees this giant valley of dry bones. Uh, and, you know, God says, hey, do you, think, uh, do you think that I can make these live again? It's kind of like God's like, hey, do you want to see a magic trick? Uh, and interestingly enough, um, we'll see that there is, uh, the, the Muslim interpretation is not that far off from that. Um, and, um, and Ezekiel says, yeah, let's see it. Actually, there's also a Jewish source. We'll get to it. Um, and... Um, and so he prophecies over the bones, you know, God spoke these bones, these bones should live again. And all of a sudden the bones start coming back to life. <clears throat> and then they breathe wind into it and they're completely revived uh, human beings. And, and these dry bones are now living again. So 
what exactly this prophecy is telling us, how it uh, manifests uh, as a message of hope, uh, seems relatively simple on its face, but it's actually a little bit more complicated, and we'll get into it. Um, but I do want to just say that um, it's amazing. We will see that this, you know, whatever it is, uh, 14, 15 verses uh, of the Bible have echoed so profoundly throughout history. Um, we will see it from silly uh, references in pop culture all the way to some of the most significant events of, uh, of Jewish history uh, in even the 20th century. Um, so I was just going to quickly start with the silly because I thought it was interesting. Um, the dry bones is actually um, shown up, uh, made its way into popular culture, um, right? We have, um, if you see here on the left, this is actually a bad guy from the Super Mario franchise, and they're called dry bones bad guys. Um, and that is because when you jump on them, they collapse into a pile of bones and die. And then a few minutes later, they actually revive themselves and put themselves back together and start attacking you again. Uh, so I guess we're very much in the spirit uh, of, uh, of the prophecy itself. Um, of course, there's a theme. A little bit of biology uh, through that song as a kid, um, and that is basically that that song. This kid song is inspired by the dry bones prophe prophecy. Um, and if any of you read the Jerusalem Post and or online or or in print and happen to know that there's a, a cartoon section, uh, the cartoon was actually uh, is called the Dry Bones cartoon, named after the prophecy. Uh, it has been around since 1973, um, and it was also indeed. Uh, named after the dry bone. So uh, all of these things I think are strange and interesting and kind of silly, um, but it does speak to the fact that this this prophecy has kind of ricocheted through history to the point where you know people are very conscious of it um, and very much um, very much interested in uh, in in keeping it alive. And so the question is again uh, why. So uh, the next thing I really want to talk about was uh, how the different religions um, look at the uh, dry bones prophecy. Okay. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit about it in, in Judaism. So uh, the big conversation that we have uh, about the dry bones prophecy in Judaism takes place in the Talmud uh, in a section called Sanhedrin, uh, right, um, on page 92b. And there, there's actually a big debate amongst the rabbis uh, about the nature of this prophecy. They're basically arguing whether or not it was a dream or a parable of some kind, or it really happened. So one rabbi gets up and says, uh, you know, it was a parable. Another guy says, no, no, it's real. Another guy says, no, I'm telling you it's a parable. Uh, and another guy gets up and says, you know what? You're wrong. Not only was it not a parable, but the dead that Ezekiel revived went up to the land of Israel, married wives, had sons and daughters. And another rabbi gets up and says, I'm a descendant of, of one of those people that was revived in the dry bones. And here is my tefillin that my father's father, father, who was revived from Ezekiel left for me. Okay, so whether or not that's true, it's hard to know. Uh, but we see that the question becomes, was this a parable for the Jewish people, right? Was it really just about God giving the Jews hope after a traumatic event? I'm going to bring you back to the land of Israel. Don't lose hope. Or was it an actual um, resurrection of the dead, uh, which we talk about in Messianic times? And was this was kind of like the, the proto uh a resurrection of the dead um, that we were that we were seeing uh, that Ezekiel was seeing before his eyes and alluding to the one at the end of days. Um, now we actually have an interesting clue um, potentially as to at least what some Jews thought um, because if you guys know famously um, in 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 um, in the 60s uh, Israel was uh, able to finally get their hands on uh, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls right the scrolls uh, found in Qumran uh, which were um, old uh, biblical scrolls written by the Essien sect. Uh, of Judaism that lived in the time of the Second Temple. Um, and uh, one of the scrolls that they found is a scroll on the picture on the right called Proto -Eze uh, Pseudo Ezekiel, sorry, which is a different version of the book of Ezekiel that we have. And in it, if you look at the, uh, the Dry Bones prophecy, it actually has uh, a, pre a preface to the prophecy in which Ezekiel asked God a question first. And Ezekiel basically asked God the question we all ask, which is like, why do, bad th why do bad things happen to good people? Like, hey, God, I I've seen a lot of righteous people come to really bad ends. Like, when do they get rewarded for their, um, when do they get rewarded for their, for their righteousness? 
And God, as an answer, says to him, I will show you um, exactly when they get rewarded for their righteousness. And then uh, we see the um, dry bones prophecy. Um, and God says after the, the prophecy to Ezekiel, um, until the days a tree shall bend and shall stand. Basically, he says at the end of days, this is going to happen. And all of the righteous people are going to be, be rewarded with resurrection of the dead. Uh, so um, first of all, this is very novel. For Judaism because it's the only place in Judaism where it discusses that only the righteous will merit to be resurrected in the, in the time of the Messiah. Of the Mashiach. Um, but uh, even if it's not the correct interpretation, it makes it very clear that by the second temple times, uh, the dry bones was used as proof for resurrection of the dead um, as, much as, um, as much as for a literal parable for God um, returning the Jews. Uh, but what is clear is no matter what, it is a message of hope, right? Either it's a message of hope uh, that God is going to bring these Jews in Babylon back to the land of Israel, or it's a message of hope that at the end of days, um, we will all be um, restored and resurrected again uh, in the times of the Mashiach and the Messiah. Um, so that's Judaism. Um, Christianity, of course, is very similar to Judaism, but with its own perspective on the same story. So they have the same story completely of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, um, but Christianity, of course, sees it through their lens, uh, and they see it um, more as a prophecy of the end of days in which, um, right, the one that's a famous, uh, famously put up on the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Ezekiel is a very prominent figure in the Sistine Chapel, in fact. Um, <clears throat> they basically see it as the dry bones prophecy is a prophecy about <clears throat> when they have the second coming and Jesus is resurrected, um, all the Jews uh, will basically be resurrected and given uh, a final opportunity to, um, I guess, repent, as it were, and, and announce their now new belief in Jesus and, and follow in his path. Um, and uh, this will happen at the end of days when, when Jesus returns and creates his new kingdom. Um, I should say also that modern um, Christian um, preachers have used this, of course, uh, for their own uh, flock as well, right? Sometimes they face lackluster attendance in the church or, you know, not a lot of passion in the church, and they will refer to their, um, to their flock as, as being a bunch of dry bones. <laughs> so I guess you could use it uh, in that text as well. And what's interesting is that it's also uh, seen in, it, it, makes its, it makes itself seen in, in Islam. Um, in the second uh, chapter of the Quran, um, there is this story about Allah telling, um, passing a group of people, telling them to die, and then reviving them. Um, and that it's a very, um, I would say it's a very uh, sp sparse uh, passage with not a lot of context. Uh, and because of that, the, the, the Quran has its own um, oral, oral Torah. I mean, it's not oral Torah, oral Quran, I guess we'll call it. Um, and it, those are called hadiths, which are interpretations. Uh, of the of the line, and even uh, Ibn Abbas, who was uh, actually one of the Prophet Muhammad's uncles uh, here on the left, uh, he was famous for his commentary on the Quran, and he wrote a hadith on this, claiming that this was actually the story of the dry bones. Uh, he said that there were a bunch of people that were running away from the land of Israel because uh, fear of a plague. The angel of death struck them down. Ezekiel, uh, or they call him Hizkiel, uh, walks by and stands among the bones, and Allah says, "Hey, do you want me to show you how I can bring them back to life?" And his kill says, yeah, sure, let's do it. And uh, God tells him to revive the bones, just like we have in the story in, in, in the Bible. Um, and uh, after that, the, all the bones are brought together and say, blessed are you, O Lord, and all praise is yours. And uh, the Muslims actually use this as a, um, as a proof for God's uh, tremendous uh, otherworldly power. Um, so I do think it's interesting to see that uh, the dry bones prophecy has resonated through all religions. Um, and uh, I think that, again, is part of the testament to why it was so, uh, uh, about, to how powerful it was. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on, uh, and the rest of the time it's what I'm going to focus on, is uh, the connection between the Ezekiel's prophecy of the dry bones and um, Zionism, right? Because what's going to end up happening is we're going to see uh, that the early Zionists uh, are going to adopt the dry bones as basically a prophecy about themselves. Um, if you take a look at this picture on the right here, it's a postcard from the year 1900. Um, and it's a drawing of the dry bones prophecy. And of all the faces, there's only two that are actually discernible people that we know. The first one closest to Ezekiel is Max Nordau. And the second one is, of course, Theodore Herzl. 
And these were the two leaders of the Zionist movement at the time. So it was already becoming clear um, <clears throat> that uh, there was some kind of connection between Zionism and the dry bones. And if you think about it, uh, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, the Jews, just like in the in the destruction of the first temple, were exiled um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, were promised one day that they would come back to the land. God would restore the Jews to the land of Israel. That sounds like Zionism to me. Um, but the thing is, I don't know how many people ever really realize just how influential the prophecy of the dry bones was to the Zionists. And, and I want to give you a couple of examples just so you understand, um, you know, just how much this, this message of hope resonated um, some 25, not even 30, 3,000 years after it was originally uh, said. Um, I mean, there are myriad examples of, uh, of the dry bones and the Zionist ethos, and I'm just going to share a, a few. One of them I actually discovered uh, on my own. Um, one of the places that we go with our students um, is we take them down to David Ben-Gurion's Negev hut. Uh, okay, uh, David Ben-Gurion, who was the founding father of Israel, and is his first prime minister, um, was the prime minister uh, for the first uh, five years of the country. And then in 1953, out of nowhere, he calls it quits. He just up and stops. It's, I mean, like, it's like an American president up and stopping and deciding to go become a potato farmer in Idaho. David Ben-Gurion decides he's gonna move down to the Negev desert and become a, a farmer. Uh, first, he is uh, shoveling cow poop. Uh, after that, he is working with the sheep. Uh, and this is what he decides to do. And in this, uh, in this uh, idea of modesty, uh, he also uh, built a very tiny hut that has no luxuries except for one, save for one luxury, and that was his library. So when I take my students into his hut, we go and we check out all of the amazing modesty that is his house. Right? I usually show them a picture of Mount Vernon first and understand this was George Washington's house and this is David Ben-Gurion's house and oh my God. Um, but when you go into his uh, library, you do see that it's really, I mean, it's his one, it's his one treasure there. Um, and so they have all the library pretty much still intact and you can't see it in the pictures, but there's a rope that kind of ropes it off. Um, and if you cross that rope, it buzzes, right? To get you in trouble because you're not supposed to go too close to the things. And I'm pretty, people who know me know I like the rules and, um, and I'm pretty serious about not setting off that buzzer. Uh, and I have to say of the tons of times I've been in, in, in the library with my students, uh, I've only ever set off the buzzer once. And that was when I was in there and I was looking around and every time there's something new to see and I was looking around, I was standing in this corner and I noticed this plaque right over here. And the closer you get to it, the easier it is to read. And eventually I came to realize, this is the zoom here on the bottom, it is the prophecy of the dry bones. And I had no idea that this was here. I thought that's weird. Like the Vipin Gurion, by the way, who was completely secular and you know, he knew the Tanakh and, and he believed in the Tanakh. He was very uh, serious about the Tanakh, but like, you, you know, if you're going to have anything in your, I mean, he had statues of like Greek philosophers and a picture of Abraham Lincoln and the, the dry bones of all things. That's what's in his, that's what's in his, uh, that's what's in his library. And then I started to think back at all the pictures I've seen of David Ben-Gurion in his library. And I realized he has two desks when you go in there now. There's a desk here and there's a desk off to the right of this picture here. See, if you see in the top left, this is him sitting at that desk. And every picture that you see of him in his library, he's sitting at that desk to the left. And I thought about it and I realized what that meant. That meant that every single time that David Ben-Gurion sat down in his library, he was staring directly at the prophecy of the dry bones. He chose to sit across from that. It wasn't just that he chose to have it in his library. That was what was sitting in his eyeline. And, and I found that amazing. Again, for someone who never really heard about the dry bones until relatively recently, I couldn't believe that this was something that he chose to like see, look at as inspiration every single day. I mean, this is David Ben-Gurion, it's a big deal. Um, so that for me was like the first inkling I started to get of uh, just how powerful this was in the, in the Zionist uh, ideal. Next, um, you know, in 1956, uh, for Israel's eighth anniversary, uh, it got a gift. Uh, the British Parliament decided to give Israel a present. Uh, and for its eighth anniversary on April, in April of 1956, the British Parliament gave Israel a 14-foot high menorah that is still on display outside the Knesset, Israel's parliament today. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. And if you actually get close to the menorah, you will see that the menorah has a ton of uh, scenes carved into it. Um, and it's meant to be like this uh, visual textbook of Jewish history. And if you look right at the middle base 
it's kind of like the middle of the middle of the menorah, you indeed will have the prophecy of the dry bones. So we have the dry bones staring at David Ben-Gurion in his library in the negative. We have the prophecy of the dry bones staring straight smack in the middle of the Knesset, right? Israel's parliament every single day. And I thought that those two were particularly powerful, um, but I don't think it was the most powerful. And I wanted to share just two more uh, area, two more places where the dry bones pops up that finally like nail in this idea of why, of how powerful the dry bones was for the Zionists and, and what it means for us today. Um, in 1963, uh, Israel's chief archaeologist and Israel's also first chief of staff of the IDF, uh, a man named Yigal Yadin, you can see him on the left, uh, began his three-year dig of Masada. Right? Masada is a pretty famous story. Now, when the dig was happening, every single thing that they found on Masada was front page news. People were dying to know what, what was found up there. And the truth is they found a ton of amazing things. And one of the things that Yigal Yadin really wanted to find, and he thought he had found, was the synagogue, the ancient synagogue of Masada. The problem was he wasn't 100% convinced that it was the synagogue. And so he thought about it and he said, I wish there was something else that we could find in this room that would tell us that this was the synagogue. And so he assigned a, a, a man to dig. His name was Moshe Cohen. He was an officer in the Israeli Navy. And Moshe Cohen is in charge of digging in this area that they think is the synagogue. See if you find anything. So Moshe Cohen digs for a couple of days and he can't really find anything. And he's getting kind of discouraged. And all of a sudden, he's digging, 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 and he finds, oh my god, there's a hollow floor here. There's something here hollow. This is amazing. And so, you know, nobody unearths anything big without Yigal Yadin, the big boss, coming. So they call him over. And at the same moment that Yigal Yadin is called over, Moshe Cohen, the guy who's digging, gets a telegram. This is Yigal Yadin himself tells the story. Moshe Cohen gets a telegram and he opens it up and it says, you Moshe Cohen of the Navy have been called in for three days of reserves. You must come now. And Cohen's, you know, he's heartbroken. He's been, you know, digging for days. He hasn't found anything. He thinks he's finally made a breakthrough and now he has to leave for three days. And he begs Yigal Yadin, please don't unearth what I found until I get back. And Yigal Yadin writes in his diary, you know, it's killing me. It's hard. I'm so excited. I'm so anxious. I need to know what we found here. I need to know if this is a synagogue, but I just thought it wasn't right. And they wait three whole days uh, to actually open it up. And finally, Moshe Cohen comes up. They open up the ground and they discover that it is the ancient Geniza of Masada. The Geniza is the area where you put uh, papers with God's name on it, right? That you bury. Uh, we don't throw them in the trash, we bury them, we give them a respectful burial. Uh, and this was the ancient Geniza of Masada, which helped them confirm that this indeed was um, the synagogue. And right at the very top of the pile of papers in the Geniza, in the best condition of any of the scrolls, staring at Yigal Yadin and Moshe Cohen, in fact, was Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophecy of the dry bones. Why is that so significant? I want to give you one last piece, and I think that we can combine this Masada story and the last piece together and understand why it was such a big deal uh, to them. And that is actually um, a song we many, most of us know called Hatikva. In 1878, a man named Naftali Hertz Ember wrote the long form version of a poem called Tikva Tenu, right? It was a long poem. Eventually, it was shortened and renamed Hatikva. In 1897, at the first Zionist Congress, Hatikva was officially chosen as the anthem of the Zionist movement um, and also became the anthem of Israel um, unofficially since 1948, only officially since 2004. What they were taking, why they took so long, I don't know, but everything takes a while in Israel. It was probably the paperwork. Um, but Hatikva um, has been the song of the Zionists from end of the 19th century. Um, and so let me ask you, what on earth does Hatikva have to do with the prophecy of the dry bones? Well, it's hard for us to know when I read the dry bones for you in English, but if you read the dry bones in Hebrew, you actually can see exactly what the connection is. Because if you look at verse 11 in the dry bones, it says, son of man, these bones are a whole house of Israel. Behold, they are bones are, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off. 
But if you read that part in Hebrew, the part that says our bones are dry and our hope is lost, it says, Yevshu atzmotenu ve'avda tikvatenu. Right? Yevshu atzmotenu, our bones are dried up, ve'avda tikvatenu. We have lost our hope. And if you look in the fifth line of Atikva, we know that it says, Od lo avda tikvatenu. We have still not lost hope, which means Naftali, Kurtz, Ember, again, a completely secular Jew, known for his secularity, um, wrote in Hatikva itself a direct response to the Valley of the Dry Bones. He is saying, we will not become dry. We have not lost hope. He adopted the exact language so it would be clear that he was speaking about the Dry Bones prophecy. He is responding that Zionism is the guarantee that we will not become dry bones. And I think that really helps us understand why the find on Masada was so significant as well. Because here we have a vision. If you think about it, it's really, it's, it's amazing. Just think about the timing. The prophecy itself was given by a prophet to give hope to the Jews who were crushed after the destruction of the first temple. It was buried at Masada by Jews who had just witnessed the destruction of the second temple. And they left it there as a message of hope, hoping that one day Jews of the future would unearth it and take it as a message of hope. And who was it found by? The Zionists in the 60s who believed that they were in their own way building the third temple, which they refer to uh, the state of Israel as, as the third temple, the rebuilding of the modern state of Israel. And in one story, we can see that the Dry Bones prophecy has served as a message of hope from generation to generation to generation for thousands of years. It's, to me, Again, as someone who didn't know it well, this prophecy might be the secret to our survival. And I think it really tells us two things. One, just how significantly Jews today as Zionists see that Zionism is an answer to this thousands of year old plight. But more generally, I think taken as a whole, it's amazing to see that this single chapter of Tanakh has echoed so loudly through history, and I think it's pretty clear why. Whether it was a parable or whether it was a real event, every single one of us at some point in our lives feel like dry bones. And what's amazing is if you look at the story of the Jewish people, if you look at the story of Zionism, if you look at the prophecy of the dry bones, it will become clear to you that even if you feel completely dry, your hope is lost, don't lose hope. A promise of renewed spirit has been given to us, to the Jews, to the world. Hang on to it. We can all use it. Don't lose hope. And that's the message that I wanted to leave you guys with today um, and thank you guys so much for joining.